After the last two introductory sessions, we will now begin with the analysis or interpretation of the first Psalm of David. Blessed is the man or the person who has not walked in the counsel of the ungodly. David here begins the encomium of the godly or pious men. And towards the end of this psalm, the psalmist will call the ungodly person chaff, the very fine type of chaff that easily scatters and it's gone by the wind. Here in the verses of this short psalm, David reveals the secret of happiness and the way of blessedness. The man who truly tries to live by the law of God is truly happy and content. The pious man is truly blessed. People in general do everything to be happy and all people want to be happy. And rightfully so, because God did not create us to be miserable or to be on a bed of suffering. God created us very good according to Genesis. He created us to share in his love and his blessedness and his eternity. He endowed us with his gifts, his grace, and his image. One of the constituents of the image is free will. So we needed to exercise our God-given free will to either walk towards him or walk away from him. Our progenitors made the wrong choice and by freely choosing to walk away from God, they bequeathed to the entire human race the spiritual illness leading to corruption and finally death. The prospect of death brought much misery, anxiety, and unhappiness to all the generations after Adam, especially to those who made no effort to live under the statutes of God. Death was not in the plan of God. God did not create death and does not take pleasure in the loss of life. This is exactly what the word makarios in Greek insinuates. Makarios, the one who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly and the impious, but makarios, translated blessed, literally means the one who does not die, the one who will not suffer damage. So the truly makarios or blessed man is the one who knows deep down that he will live forever. The one who knows how to transcend death. And now David will show us how to transcend death. If you remember from the uh, last session, Athanasius the Great told us that the Psalms will not simply announce to us great truths, but will give us specific details on how to walk as children of God. This is precisely what David does from the very first verse of this Psalm. He will tell us how to transcend death, how to avoid the wages of sin, which is death. In order to live a life of blessedness and to have the Macaria el Pida of St. Paul, the blessed hope, we must make the right choices in this life. The person will continue to live a life of blessedness if he abstains from the path that invites evil. Blessed is the man who has not walked in the counsel of the ungodly and has not stood in the way of sinners and has not sat in the seat of evil men. Here, David pinpoints the three progressive stages towards the path of evil. I walk, I stand, and I sit. The man of piety needs to know how and where to walk, where to stand, and where to sit. We will use a biblical example here from one of the children of Jacob, his daughter Dinah. At some point, the daughter of Jacob and Leah went forth to observe and inquire about the life of the nearby inhabitants. She was perhaps bored, and she wished to see how they dressed, what makeup they used at that time, and uh, curiosity got the best of her. So she walked and she stood with these neighboring females wishing to learn earthly things from them. As she was standing, she was seen by Shechem, the territory prince, and he asked her to walk with him. After some flattery about her looks, perhaps, no doubt, she walked some more with him, then she sat with him in a private setting, and then she was defiled or humbled by him, as the scripture says. So here we have a prime example of walking curiously, standing and enjoying idle talk, luring conversation, and finally falling into sin, a sin that caused the death of hundreds of men. I will not 
narrate the entire story, you can find it in Genesis 34. She walked in questionable territory all by herself, which is a big mistake. She eagerly stood and took notes from the daughters of the idolaters and then sat with Shechem in a private setting. Some of their modern English Bibles are in a hurry to accuse Shechem of rape. The Septuagint makes no mention of rape. The son of the ruler saw her, took her, and lied with her. It is a huge interpretive plunder to try to interpret events that took place 4,000 years ago by today's standards. There were no laws back then protecting women who had no rights whatsoever to begin with, and they were under the protection of their family. So Dinah is not at all innocent here. Anyone found in the territory of an ancient king or prince was at the mercy of that king. Dinah should have never walked alone in a foreign territory, especially since she had quite a few brothers who could have escorted her. It seems that Dinah had an adventurous character, and her walk towards the ungodly neighbor was very damaging physically and spiritually. A pious and godly person thinks very carefully before he walks, stands, and sits. So we walk, we stand, and we sit. We walk into a sports bar on their way home from work just to relax a little bit, just to see some friends, only for a little while. And we stand to see if we recognize anyone. And then we sit and sit and drink and sit and we get home at midnight. But a person who practices vigilance and sobriety does not walk into uncertain territory and avoids the causes of sin. So if we don't walk in the counsel of ungodly company, our mindset will not be influenced. Next to these three verbs, walk, stand, and sit, the psalmist places three categories of people, the ungodly, the sinners, and evil. So blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of evil men. So David makes a differentiation between sinners, people who are ungodly, and some people who he calls evil. Is there a difference? Well, let's see. The one who violates the first commandment is ungodly. The one who violates the fifth, sixth, seventh, ninth, tenth commandment is a sinner. Therefore, if I am a thief, a fornicator, I don't respect my parents, I am a sinner. However, if I don't believe in God, if I blaspheme God, if I am uh, agnostic or atheist, I am ungodly. Considering the above, it is far worse to be found in the area of impiety or ungodliness. We're all sinners, no doubt, and we sin daily, more or less. But we acknowledge our sin, and we make an effort to be freed from it. The sinful person will take his sin to confession, he will read the scriptures, the lives of the saints, and he will struggle to live a life of repentance. The ungodly person who rejected faith in God altogether and never sets foot in church is in a deplorable state. Today, there's not only very much sin in the world, but very much irreverence and impiety. People are confused, agnostic, and even godless. Naturally, people do not change from pious to ungodly overnight. A long-term sinful condition takes a person from sinfulness to ungodliness or godlessness. When a man dwells in sin and cannot fathom ever living without it, he's prone to say, there is no God. Or he begins to believe in a God that he fashions according to his own image. So we have the sinner, the unbeliever or ungodly, and the evil man. Who is the evil man translated as such from the Greek limos? First of all, there is no such thing as an evil man. No man is intrinsically evil. The devil is not evil. Evil does not exist in its essence. God did not create anything evil. Therefore, nothing evil can exist. Evil is in the free choice of demons and people, of noetic beings. Evil will not be a factor after the regeneration. The citizens of God's kingdom will not be prone to or be influenced by any type of evil whatsoever. The Greek word limos pertains to one who has the ability to pollute, to someone who is contagious. A very contagious disease in Greek is called limoxis. So out of the three states, 
I believe this is the worst one. A sinner can easily repent. He knows his failures and he does have a conscience. Christ says tax collectors and prostitutes go before you in the kingdom of God. Matthew the Apostle was a tax collector. Zacchaeus, who became a bishop of our church and a martyr after his repentance, was a chief tax collector. The Samaritan woman had five husbands and she was living with a man who was not her husband at the time. They were sinful people with passions, but sin did not corrupt their mindset. They humbled themselves, repented, and became saints. They were of good disposition. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were blinded by egotism, selfishness, and pride, and they used the tenets of the law for the wrong reason. They did not see the law of God as therapeutic discipline necessary for their inner purification as the way to righteousness, but they erroneously believed that by merely adhering to the letter of the law, they were automatically the elect of God, and their duty was to point out the faults of others. They displayed their pietism on the streets, wishing to influence others by their sanctimonious actions and appearance. They were so full of spiritual sufficiency and demonic pride that they expected Christ to congratulate them for their flawless religiosity and righteousness. Anyone who opposed them was automatically castigated as a sinner, labeled an ignoramus, and demon-possessed and was ostracized. It is with much sadness that we observe the same Pharisaic traits with the so-called born-again Christians who erroneously believe in, in instant justification and unconditional salvation, and as such, they devote their entire energy and effort to save others and make them polluted like themselves. So the Pharisees were no less godless than the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection. In reality, very few Pharisees believed in Christ despite all the miracles, and the vast majority of them were not touched by his words. Although it is not always good to generalize, we could say that most of Christ's followers came from the ranks of simple, simple people, simple sinners and much fewer from the ranks of the ungodly or those of a Pharisaic attitude and spirit. And I believe extremely few came forth from the category of limi, or those who pollute others from their spiritual pollution. These are not simply indifferent or agnostic, but intolerant. They are possessed by demonic energy, and they wish to share that energy with anyone who sits to listen to them. They are characterized by an incurable ego, and they work incessantly to project themselves along with their agenda. This is the most dangerous group of people by far because uh, they possess many natural abilities and gifts, such as Arius and the early heretics. They were endowed with a very sharp intellect and strong reason. Julian the Apostate and all Christian enemies and fighters, they could not accept a meek and humble Christ who conquered people's hearts with compassion and love. People in this group generally cannot go under the yoke of Christ. How did Christ express this? When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, and after Pentecost this took place through baptism, when a demon spirit is exercised from the heart of a man, then he goes through deserted places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came from. And when he returns, he finds his previous house empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell here, and then the last state of that man is worse than the first. During his first state, this poor man was probably a sinner, agnostic, or even an idolater. He was baptized, but he did not wish to undertake the necessary struggle to go under the yoke of Christ. He considered the yoke of Christ heavy after he cleaned his soul with holy baptism. And now he did not wish to use and undertake the necessary struggle and the weapons of righteousness, according to St. Paul. So he became easy prey to the passions and the seven demons who enter his heart all over again. 
seven demons is a symbolic number and means a multitude of evil spirits. And the last state of this Christian man will be much worse than the first. This might explain why Christian European nations began such an inexorable fight against the gospel of Christ that led to the theology of the death of God a couple centuries ago. Heresies, world wars, lewdness, widespread immorality, homosexuality, millions of abortions yearly are the rotten fruit of demonized Christian nations. The theory of evolution, pornography, the homosexual agenda at large, leading to the ungodly marriage of same-sex individuals, is the rotten fruit of polluted members of a demonized post-Christian society. Polluted with a demonic illness, and much like their patrons, they want to enter every human heart on the planet, every elementary school, and every playground. King David singles out this category of people and calls them polluters or pathogens. Blessed and happy is the man who has not sat in the seat of spiritual polluters. Here we can think of a university classroom. Our children go to these classrooms to complete their education. They want to be educated in biology, chemistry, physics, etc., and according to some statistics, out of 100 believing Christian children, 51% come back from these seats agnostic. They will no longer believe in Christ. This is exactly what the psalmist is referring to. About 30 years ago, while still in my initial zeal, I spoke at a priest conference about this topic and I made a statement that if I knew that my son or daughter would lose their faith in college, then I would prefer for them not to go to college. And one of the priests said, well, this is the type of fanatical thinking that we must avoid. Well, perhaps he thought that I meant that we should not send our children to universities. No, that's not what I meant. Everyone has to decide for themselves, and every child is different. But in the very least, we better put in place some very strong catechism classes to inoculate our high school seniors with the proper spiritual antibodies before they enter that higher education. Education is important. But it does not make people full of blessedness. Blessedness, according to the words of the Holy Spirit, comes from staying clear of impiety, ungodliness, sin, and spiritual pollution. Blessedness comes from being free from demonic influences, by purifying our hearts, and by staying under the yoke of Christ. Ungodliness, impiety, sinfulness, and polluting agendas lead to misery, bondage, and spiritual and physical death. It is considered a hate crime to speak about the bondage of homosexuality. Yet from a Christian perspective, I consider it a spiritual hate crime against the human soul to remain silent about these things. Most of our bishops, priests, and lay assistants are silent about this spiritual disease. Christ was not politically correct when he said that when your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. And anyone who loves son, daughter, mother, father, more than me is not worthy of me. The church is a Christian hospital and can heal any passion. The fornicator, the thief, the molester, the embezzler, the lesbian, everyone can repent and become a saint. The sinners come to church to change their ways to be healed and saved by the grace of God. Like David, who committed adultery and murder, they can humbly ask God to forgive them. They acknowledge their sin, their lawlessness, and they ask for a contrite spirit. And there are plenty of ungodly sinners who change their ways and found God and blessedness. But not the Pharisees, and not those polluted by demonic pride, and those unwilling to sacrifice their hedonistic lifestyle. Those who have become nothing but flesh. And this is the third category. They demand that the church needs to stop being anachronistic. They demand the entire world to bow down to their passions and perversions. And they want the church to change to accommodate them. This is bordering the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. These poor souls, full of the seven unclean spirits, fight Christ in the worst way. They create their own perverse demon theology. Somehow God did not only 
make a male and female, but God made some half male, some half female, some transsexual, some uh, transgender, and so on. We are simply exposing the demonic minds of these polluters who confuse the minds of young people. Christ, the God of love, does not hesitate to tell them what to do if they continue in their evil ways. It is better for them to tie a millstone around their neck and jump into any one of the five oceans of the planet. The sin of suicide will be more profitable for them compared to what awaits them in the other life if they die unrepented. So blessed is the man who avoids the path to sinfulness, which can lead to godlessness and impiety. Now, how does this take place? How do we avoid the territory and causes of sin and impiety? The second verse of this psalm gives the answer. We do this when our pleasure is in the law of God and when we meditate in his law day and night. So blessed is the man who has the law of God, the statutes of God, the name of God on his lips day and night. What an amazing agreement between the books of Scripture. King and prophet David tells the pious Israelites that a man will avoid temptation and sin only when he aligns his will with the will and statutes of God. When he has the law of God on his lips day and night. The Septuagint translates the Hebrew word yenge, meditate. But in reality, the Hebrew is much more detailed. It says, it means whisper. The pious Israelites used to have the Psalms and the Odes and the prayers of the Old Testament, the words of the Lord of the Old Testament, on their lips unceasingly. Even today, Orthodox Jews walking down the street, especially on the Sabbath, they are constantly whispering. They are whispering Psalms or some prayers of the Old Testament. St. Paul admonishes the Christians of his churches to pray unceasingly. As Orthodox Christians, we are taught by our Holy Fathers to repeat the Jesus prayer at every place and every hour. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Generally speaking, it is of great benefit when we have the Word of God on our lips day and night. A man who has the words of Scripture on his lips, or prays the Psalms or some of our common church prayers, will not have any room to lie or say coarse jokes or offend anyone. The spirit of the law of God and the spirit that accompanies our prayers will allow only good and edifying things to come out of our mouths. And he shall be as a tree planted by the brooks of waters, which shall yield its fruit in its season, and its leaves shall not fall off. And whatsoever he shall do shall be prospered. What a beautiful image. As you know, Christ is always represented with water. When Moses struck the rock in the desert and water sprung out, that water and the rock was Christ. St. Paul attests to this when he says, And the rock was Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, 4. So the pious man, the godly man, has his thoughts, his senses, his desires in the law of God, in the word of God, and he is in Christ. Like a healthy fruit tree, he has his roots in the water called Christ, and if he is rooted in Christ, he will produce wonderful spiritual fruit in due season, and whatsoever he shall do shall be prospered. This reminds of uh, the son of Rachel and Jacob, Joseph, a type of Christ sold by his very own brothers in Genesis 39.2. And we read, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and his master knew that the Lord was with him, and the Lord prospers in his hands whatsoever he happens to do. And the Lord continued to bless Joseph, especially after he refused to become polluted by his master's lustful wife. Not so the ungodly, not so, but rather a chaff which the wind scatters away from the face of the earth. The works and the accomplishments of the ungodly will be gone by the wind sooner or later. After a generation or two, he is remembered no more. His works do not have eternal dimensions. 
they will be burned in the test of God's judgment. His works are made out of uh, grass, wood, and flammable materials. His works do not have eternal dimensions, and they will be burned in the test of God's judgment. His works are made out of uh, grass, wood, and flammable materials, which means that his works were not for the glory of God, but for his own materialistic earthly satisfaction. Therefore, the ungodly shall not rise in judgment, nor sinners in the counsel of the just. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. During the day of judgment, the ungodly and unrepented sinners will not be able to raise their heads to look at Christ. They will not rise does not mean that they will not resurrect. Every human being that lived on earth from the time of Adam will receive their spiritualized body, the same body that they possessed on earth. The body will also be judged along with the soul, many psychosomatic, because man sinned with his body and soul, and he became holy with his body and soul. So our bodies will come out of the tombs, but the ungodly will not rise to meet the Lord in the, in the air. Their bodies will be like black and blue and wounded by the demonic passions. They will be hellbound. They will be hellbound and gloomy. So they will resurrect, they will be judged, but they will not rise up to meet Christ and the angels in midair. So the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The Lord knows everything. The Lord knows everything. He knows the pious, the ungodly, the saints, and the most horrific sinners. He knows them all. God is all-knowing and everywhere. But He only recognizes His own, those whose names are written in the book of life. Christ often spoke about false prophets who will ask for recognition on the day of judgment, who will ask for recognition on the day of judgment. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many miracles in your name? And then I will declare to them, Uki daimas. I never knew you. What a chilling surprise at the final moments of history. And please try to convey this very serious message to all non-Orthodox at work who run to the streets to save others, to speak the word of God, but they never take care to purify their souls. I don't know you. What Christ means here is that unless we take the time to possess the attributes of Christ, to become the mind of Christ, to become meek and humble like Christ, Christ will say, I don't recognize anything of mine in your heart. You don't belong to me. He will look for humility meekness, compassion, philanthropy, forgiveness, peace, and sacrificial love. And this is precisely why St. Isaac the Syrian teaches that the one who purifies his heart from evil passions is higher than the one who resurrects the dead. I don't know you means you did not choose me over your selfish passions. You chose to live with your earthly enemies, with your demonic passions, and did not open the door of your heart to let me come in. So depart from me, you who practice lawlessness and unrighteousness. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Amen.